Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. We're gonna get started. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on reducing your consumption. So before we begin, please just note that everyone's microphones have been muted just in order to prevent background noise. And if you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free just to type them in the question field in the toolbar that's on the right-hand side of your screen. And we'll be sure to get to them at the end of the webinar. So we'll also be recording the webinar today and you'll receive an email with a link to this after the webinar is finished. So my name is Lindsay and I'm joined today by my colleague Savannah and we are both waste diversion specialists here at Bush Systems. If you're not familiar, Bush is a designer and manufacturer of customized waste and recycling containers. Our role here at Bush is to help our clients be successful with their recycling and diversion efforts. We offer waste audits and recommendations on best practices in the industry. Our webinar today is going to focus on reducing your consumption. In our roles, and I know in many of your positions probably as well, um, we focus on recycling day in and day out. Today, our goal is to shed light on the fact that recycling can only get us so far and that reducing consumption tackles many environmental issues directly at the source. After all, there's a reason that the terms reduce and reuse come before recycle. So before we get started, we wanted to quickly just run a poll question to see where you learned about today's webinar. Uh, so we're launching this now and we'll leave it up on the screen for a bit so that you have a chance to put your answer in if you don't mind. So we also came up with some learning objectives for today's webinar. So after this session, we hope that you will be able to identify the threats of overconsumption, to understand sustainable consumption, and to understand the importance of being an informed consumer, and also to identify the steps to reducing your personal and our broader societal consumption habits. Okay, so the poll is now closed. Thank you so much for the feedback that you gave. And to get right into the topic today, uh, we're gonna start by talking about the issue of consumption. So the degree in which we are producing new goods puts a huge amount of pressure on our natural resources. In 2012, 1.3 billion tons of solid waste was produced worldwide in cities. That is 1.2 kilos per person per day. So with population growth and urbanization increasing, this is expected to rise to 2.2 billion tons by 2025. Many countries around the world are already having an ecological footprint larger than what the planet can support. And United Nations warns that if global population reaches 9.6 billion by 2050, we will need the equivalent of almost three planets of resources to sustain our current lifestyles. Knowing this gives us an urgency to draw attention to the importance of reducing consumption now. So our economic systems require a substantial amount of change if we are considering a less materialistic world. And consumption is what drives our economy. The newest iPhone comes out annually, it's faster, it's smarter, we have faster laptops, more sophisticated coffee machines, and even more comfy and durable shoes. The list is continuous. And the average lifespan of a cell phone is only 18 months, and a laptop is just two years. The waste created from these repeat purchases is beyond belief. The U.S. makes up 5% of the world's population, but actually accounts for 30% of the world's waste production. This system is broken, and as we continue this lifestyle, our natural resources are just getting more and more depleted. Okay, great. So the story of stuff uh, was a YouTube video that was actually produced in 2007 by a woman named Annie Leonard. So if you haven't quite seen this video yet, uh, we highly recommend that you check it out on YouTube. It's a short film that does a really great job at highlighting our society's obsession with material goods. So Annie is actually a former Greenpeace activist, and she's always been fascinated by all of this stuff. And it started in her teenage years. And this is when she really began to wonder why we were building an economy that relied so heavily on resources. So Annie has a really interesting perspective in that she's not actually against this material stuff. There are definitely people out there that do need more, but it's the consumerism that's always the issue. So it's when we start purchasing to fill this void in our life rather than to fulfill our basic needs. 
So she's a big advocate for these studies that show that the stuff isn't making us any happier. In fact, it's actually the opposite that's the case. So there's a professor of psychology named Tim, Tim Kasser, and he found a connection between obsessively materialistic people and increased levels of anxiety and depression. There's also a big correlation between insecurity and purchasing. And study after study shows that when people relate more with money, image, and status, as these materialistic values increase, concerns about the environment actually decrease. So consideration for riding bicycles, recycling, reusing items is much less likely. So what drives consumption? There is a trend that exists between our earnings and our standard of living or our consumption. So as one rises, so does the other. It's so easy for us to be able to compare our lives with those who have more than us, those who have nicer houses, nicer clothes, nicer cars, we often fail to think about those who have a lesser standard of living that don't have the access to basic human rights like clean drinking water um, or sustainable food sources. So suddenly you, you see a shift in your perspective when you decide who you compare yourself to. So we wanna talk a little bit about textiles in particular. So many of us are aware um, of the impact our consumption uh, habits have on our planet. So when we talk about the textile industry, Americans on average throw away 68 pounds of textiles a year. The industry is a huge consumer and polluter of water uh, because of the specific treatment and dyeing processes. And 17 to 20% of the total industrial water pollution actually comes from textile dyeing specifically. The wastewater from the industry is disposed into water bodies with no treatment and contains a whack of chemicals that are known to cause severe health issues. So to make one cotton t-shirt, it requires 2,650 liters of water. This is the equivalent to 27 bathtubs full of water. Our overconsumption of clothing and our obsession with the fa fashion industry is a major contributor to this issue. And because of the increase in consumption, 100 billion new garments are produced every year, and this is double the amount that was being produced in the year 2000. So alternatives to consuming. A shift of priorities and changing of mindsets are major aspects of reducing consumption. Consumerism is driven by consumption and it is a social action that's really become part of our culture. So shifting our mindset away from consumption opens up room for goods to be replaced with actually meaningful activities. So this can occur through more minimalistic lifestyles and promoting a decrease in use of natural resources, while at the same time supporting stronger and more fulfilling relationships. So once clutter disappears from people's lives, a lot of people feel that they have more purpose and a life filled with more passion. And as intrinsic values go up, materialistic values go down, kind of like a seesaw. So some ideas for developing and nurturing more intrinsic values include um, things like spending time outdoors, spending time with family, uh, volunteering more of our time. So trying to develop these types of alternative strategies to find happiness um, in the things that really matter. So a lot of people with this type of lifestyle find a life of less worry, less de debt, and definitely less stuff. Okay, so as consumers are becoming more and more aware of the tactics that advertisers and marketers use to promote their products, the consumer mindset is definitely starting to change. So we start to ask ourselves the questions, will this fad diet really make me lose 30 pounds in one month? Will that mascara make me look like the same as that supermodel? $150 billion is spent to get these messages to us annually across every platform that you can imagine. TV, radio, magazines, billboards, with a very extreme and unique example shown here with the Cadbury chocolate bar, and even in public bathrooms. So we would ask you to consciously resist the power of these ads. Think about what they're saying to us. As people begin to make these connections, the idea of sustainable consumption becomes more and more powerful. 
So getting into a bit about sustainable consumption, it has definitely received more and more attention over the years as consumers are becoming more aware that our current rates of consumption are very unsustainable. An interesting method of thought related to this is that if a product cannot be reused, recycled, or composted, then the industry should not produce this product at all. A reduction in consumption of goods is rooted in the change not only to the consumer behavior, but also in production of goods. This is a familiar concept of a circular economy, a framework becoming more and more accepted. A shift to sustainable consumption habits and production of goods should happen simultaneously to really spark meaningful change in our society. So adopting the mindset that we should not be producing anything we cannot eventually reuse or recycle is a crucial step. So Bush Systems actually produced a video that discusses more about the circular economy and it really sums this concept up well. So we would like to share this video with you now and we just ask that you let us know um, if there's any trouble with the audio. Today, we're gonna to talk about the circular economy. This idea stems from the sobering realization that the ever-running engine of consumerism is not slowing down. Newsflash, people want more stuff, and they want more and more stuff every year, and this stuff requires more and more resources, and we don't have unlimited resources. This means moving away from the traditional take, make, use, dispose model, and moving towards designing products with the end of life in mind. But isn't that just recycling? Recycling? That's circular economy. Garage sales? Circular economy. Anaerobic digestion, composting, reusing, upcycling, that's all circular economy. But wait, it doesn't stop there. Those are all examples of what we can do once the end of life has been reached. But how can we better design products to allow them to be used again? It's been said that approximately 80% of a product's environmental impact is determined in the design phase. This includes extraction, processing, manufacturing, distribution, use, and disposal. How can we ensure that through every phase of a product's life cycle, we're doing what we can to maximize resources, reduce waste, and extend the product's lifetime? Products should be created from the ground up with the intent of being able to reuse them. Create products that are modular, easy to disassemble, and easy to repair. If you've ever had to have work done on appliances or electronics, you know that it costs basically the same amount of money to replace them as it does to repair them. This needs to stop. It's a huge waste of resources that can easily be designed out in the planning phase. Another component of modular design is making it easier to recycle products. Do we really need all that excessive packaging? Do your shoes really need three different types of material, textiles, fabric, and plastics, all molded together to make a product? The circular economy is saying that there's no such thing as waste. Everything can be reused in some way, shape, or form. There are so many opportunities for implementation everywhere you look, across all industries, and making very unique partnerships. Omni United, the tire manufacturer, has partnered up with Timberland, the shoemaker, and designed their tires in such a way that they can be reused and remade into Timberland's outer soles. Method, the household cleaner manufacturer, actually collects and uses ocean plastics in the creation of its packaging and bottles. Every year, countless farmers send their manure and byproduct to waste to energy facilities, where they get broken down and the byproduct is a gas that can be used to create more energy. A tree grows and generates biomass using the power from the sun. To reproduce, the tree may create fruit that holds seeds within. These fruits are eaten by wildlife and can be transported far away from the site of origin. The tree's leaves and branches can also provide shelter for other organisms. And when the tree finally reaches its end of life and falls to the ground, microorganisms called decomposers can use the biomass as a food source. And in this process, returning its essential nutrients back into the soil where they can be used by new tree seedlings, perpetuating the cycle. This is how we must be thinking if we want to achieve ambitious goals like zero waste and the circular economy. We have to be analyzing complex webs of materials, always improving processes, and doing what we can to minimize and eliminate waste. It all comes back to that old saying, one man's trash is another man's treasure. That circular economy. Okay. <clears throat> So hopefully that um, video showed up okay for everyone. If it didn't, there's definitely a link that's gonna be sent out for the recording of it where it will be included. And you could also find it that video along with other um, sustainability vlogs on our company Bush Systems YouTube channel. 
So as we talked about in the video, changing our lifestyles ourselves is not enough. Advocating for policies and representatives that promote intrinsic values is crucial. So for example, France now recognizes that it cannot only focus on GDP when analyzing economic growth. They have started to look at their citizens' well-beings and their connections to their communities as well. Policies like this in Canada and the US need more support and promotion by citizens to make this important change. So now we want to talk a little bit about informed consumers. So tackling overconsumption as a single individual really seems like a daunting task at times. So where would we start? Well, as consumers, we have an ability to change um, our consumption culture. By being an informed consumer, this is really our first step. Being mindful of the difference between needing something and wanting something. So we have so much power to decide if we really truly do need something. So use this power to make the right choices for our planet. So illustrated here is a hierarchy of consumption, which is from Michigan State University. Um, so what you would do is you start at the bottom and before you buy something, ask yourself, can I use what I already have? Can I borrow it? Can I trade it or thrift for it? Um, only when you've answered no to all of these questions should you consider purchasing a new product. So sustainable consumption comes in for those times that we actually do need to purchase something. So be aware of goods that have minimal impact on the environment and also aim to use only these specific products. Production processes and end products should require minimal resources and environmental effects like pollution. So by sustainable, eco-friendly material, it may, it may cost a little bit more initially, but the cost to our planet in the end is definitely worth it. So choosing quality and longevity of the products over um, their, their price point and their convenience. So not only does sustainable consumption support companies that are doing the right thing, it also pushes other big players to do the same. So who to support? So let's take a look at some different examples of companies that are out there that are making big leaps towards supporting sustainable consumption. So returning to our previous example of the textile industry, uh, Patagonia is a very popular outdoor clothing company and they used recycled fabrics and a lot of alternatives to um, your traditional petroleum based fibers. They use plant based dyes, they source uh, sustainable materials and fair trade factories as well. And a big part of their marketing is that they strongly encourage customers to use their repair service rather than purchasing some of their new products. Um, they also had a big campaign in the New York Times on Black Friday where they address this issue of consumerism with the don't buy this jacket campaign. So um, the ad really aimed at drawing attention to their common threads initiative, which encouraged buying uh, used products through their website, repairing the items and also recycling the materials. So Patagonia really did a good job at showing just how important reducing consumption is to them, even when it meant a decrease in sales. So the Refillery District, this is a local business here in Aurelia. They are an eco-conscious waste-free market and customers are required to bring in their own bags and containers to fill up on their different products. So they offer um, earth-friendly, cruelty-free, uh, from things like whole foods, produce, meats, uh, all the way to household cleaners. So the founders' names are Ali and Tyler, and they believe that we live in a time now where it's impossible to turn a blind eye to uh, what's happening to our planet. And they wanted to come up with a solution for your average Joe to reduce their environmental impact uh, on an everyday basis. So at first they were a little bit nervous that people might find it um, a little tricky to adopt these new changes to their lifestyle, but um, the feedback that they've gotten and the enthusiasm from their customers has really been great. So some general tips that they offer to their customers are to always bring their reusable bags, to refuse straws when dining out, and to pack lunches in reusable containers and reusable water bottles.
And we also want to talk about Lush. So Lush is a homemade cosmetic company that is 100% vegetarian. They source ethical ingredients and actually just switched to something called naked packaging. So for years, they've been working really hard to decrease the amount of packaging that they use for their products. So now all of their online orders are wrapped in 100% biodegradable materials. And when shopping in store, uh, they ask that their customers bring in reusable containers to take products home. So the company just opened their first naked shop in the UK with zero plastic packaging um, for all of their products. So now instead of uh, customers scanning the labels for ingredients, they can actually use their camera and the Lush app on their phone and it pulls up all the product info that they need. So last year alone in the UK, uh, their customers saved 1.8 million plastic bottles by choosing the naked bath options that were available. So today we really want to ask you to make the choice to reduce. Challenge yourself to adopt some principles that are involved with a zero waste lifestyle and integrating practices such as buying bulk, uh, bulk food and reusable glass jars uh, for these items are small changes that can actually make a huge impact on your waste reduction. And this also promotes the shift towards a more sustainable mindset. So when reduction isn't a possibility, recycling is the next best thing. In a new study where 2,000 Americans were surveyed, 62% of people found it to be a turnoff if someone didn't recycle. It was in the age range of 18 to 24 that were most likely to consider this behavior unattractive. So with the same age range being so aware and conscious of their impact on the environment, this is a good sign for our future. So the workplace can also be a great place to encourage reduced consumption, and it's becoming more and more common for offices, campuses, and corporations to have set waste diversion goals. Many of these companies also have an overarching vision to become actually zero waste. So one example of how reduced consumption was integrated here at Bush Systems is that to reduce the volume of disposable coffee cups, a coffee machine was actually purchased for the office. So our CEO, Craig, then provided each employee with a reusable mug for use with the machine, and it has greatly reduced the amount of disposable coffee cups that are being brought into the office on a daily basis um, because there is now this more sustainable and convenient alternative. Um, our employees also love that they can save money every day by not purchasing coffee on their way into work. So a goal for this year for our office is to eliminate water bottles from our workplace. And we also implemented organics collection into our office, which has allowed us to achieve an average diversion rate of about 80%. So adopting this shift of how we view products and consumption is definitely gonna call for a few things. So first, the big focus is gonna be on a change of culture. Um, meaning that we need to change people's views on waste and to encourage the recognition of the value of the materials. And it's gonna be a huge group effort for sure and to require the support and cooperation of both the consumers and the producers, not just one or the other. And it's also gonna require some strong leadership from governments and from citizens to change a uh, policy framework. So we ask that you take what we spoke about today and put it into practice as best that you can. And there are powerful forces that push consumerism and consumption on us in today's world. The fact that you guys took the time to attend a webinar on the topic of reducing consumption today is a great reassurance that this is a common goal. So we ask that you share this passion with your friends and family, educate your coworkers or staff, and just begin the conversation for, our, for the health of our planet and our future. We have the ability to create a future that will work in the long term. So that just about wraps up our webinar for today. We hope that you found this information valuable and enjoyed the session. And we will be sticking, sticking around for a few minutes if there are any questions to address. Otherwise, the webinar is being recorded and will be sent to you. And if you found what we discussed today valuable, please feel free to pass that along to anyone else that you can think of. And have a great day, everyone.